Good evening, everybody. Images of Remembering and Forgetting is the title of uh, the following discussion with Alida Asman, per Zoom, Christina Baldacci, per Zoom, and Sher Sharon McDonald with me here <laughs> at Akademie der Künste at Pariser Platz in the, in the center of Berlin. In some way, we are talking, taking up again the thoughts from a very important exhibition 2019 in Frankfurt. Uh, Alida Asman and uh, Sharon McDonald has written um, extensively for, for the catalogue of this exhibition. Vergessen, warum wir nicht alles erinnern. So, forgetting why we are not remembering everything. We are trying to pick up this topic and relating it at this evening with our exhibition Arbeit am Gedächtnis, Transforming Archives. The exhibition will open on 17th of June and the Academy with the archives, with her archives, 1,300 artist archives, with her artist members and with 325 years of institutional history is a container of memory and power structures in itself. We are inviting 13 artists, contemporary artists, to reflect the notion of the remembering and the forgetting in this power container, in this memory container, in their commissioned works, which will be shown from 17th of June on. We have invited artists from Alexander Kluge to Cemile Shaheen, from Candice Brights to Bob Wilson, from Miroslav Bauker to Ulrike Dresner, from Matana Roberts to Thomas Heiser. So I'm very, very happy that three experts of the memory culture and artistic work are coming together this evening. Very much, very warm welcome to you. I'm very, very happy that you are joining our uh, project today. I just want to present our three participants. Sharon MacDonald is the Alexander von Humboldt Professor of Social Anthropology at the Institute of Europe, uh, European Ethnology, Humboldt University in Berlin, and the director of the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage, and the research program Making Differences in Berlin, Transforming Museums and Cultural Heritage in the 21st Century. Christina Baldacci is an art historian specialized in contemporary art and visual studies. She's a senior researcher at the University Kafoskeri in Venice. From 2018 to 2020, she was affiliated to the ICI in Berlin. Her research interests focus on the archive and the atlas as artistic gestures and visual forms of knowledge and strategies. Alida Asman is an Anglicist, Egyptologist, and cultural theorist, and retired professor for English literature and literary, uh, literary studies at the University of Constance. The focus of her research is cultural and communicative memory. Together with her husband, Jan Asman, she was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize of the uh, German Book Trade in 2018. Her recent publications in English include Cultural Memory and Western Civilization, 2011, Shadows of Trauma, Memory and the Politics of Postwar identi Identity, 2015, and Is Time Out of Joint on the Rise and Fall of the Modern Time Regime. This evening, her lecture has a title Räumliche und zeitliche Bilder des Erinnerns und Vergessen, Spatial and Temporal Images of Remembering and Forgetting. She is touching the importance of artistic installations and works in relation to the concepts of space and time in the arrangement of what we call cultural memory. Very much welcome, 
Alida Asman, it's your floor for your lecture. Thank you very much for being here and to be again in the Academy after 2019 when you gave a wonderful lecture on the topic of the memory, which is not just materialistic, but living in the bodies of dancers and performances. Very much welcome. Please start your lecture. Thank you very much, <clears throat> dear Johannes Odenthal, for this uh, introduction and more <clears throat> than that, uh, this invitation into this wonderful group. I I'm really thrilled to discuss uh, these topics today, tonight, with um, two <clears throat> scholars who are exploring fields that are so close uh, to what I'm doing. And uh, from the beginning, I must say, in my research, I was always directed by the arts, be it the verbal or the visual arts, because I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that they know much more than we do, and that they are really the <clears throat> very important also theorists, they <clears throat> are because they reflect on what we are doing when we remember and forget. Now, when we talk about <clears throat> temporal or uh, visual image in general, visual images about remembering and forgetting, we should not forget that there are many, many intermediate stages between remembering and forgetting. And I've become more and more interested in these intermediary stages. And I will, in my short lecture, um, examine some of them. And uh, in doing so, I will focus, focus um, also on the language that we use, the metaphors uh, in our language in order to talk about remembering and forgetting. And I will also point uh, to a couple of examples, uh, be it in artworks or in installations uh, um, or other examples to illustrate what I have to say. I'm starting with uh, the remark about tiered attention in museums. We move directly into the local arrangements of um, museums here. And I would like to remind you that unlike in libraries and archives, the museum is a frame in which different degrees of intensity of remembering and forgetting are staged in their spatial arrangements. <clears throat> uh, for instance, when you come into a library, you will not immediately see where the central uh, authors of the canon are located and everything is on the periphery with respect to them. But it's quite different, the spatial arrangements in a museum. And to make this more evident, <clears throat> uh, we can use here the model, the very simple model of a store and consider for a moment the sequence of its connected rooms. So facing <clears throat> from the street, when you approach the store, First of all, you see the shop windows and um, they attract the attention of the shoppers and passers by and stimulate um, an interest in the offers uh, through their aesthetic arrangements of the products. People pass then by <clears throat> the store window to enter the store and inside, inside is the sales room where the customers will find the important goods and in a well-sorted and well-presented way to be presented and probed and of course to be bought. Beyond that then there is a third space and this third space is withdrawn from public view. But it is very important. It is the warehouse where the mer merchandise is stacked on shelves and invisibly waiting to be called for. Now this tiered spatial sequence of display window, sales room, and warehouse can be easily applied to, applied to museums. Here too, I think, uh, here too, uh, there is a front window, and these are the special exhibitions, which are carefully presented and subject to rapid change. They often move from place to place to reach as many viewers as possible. They often move <clears throat> as a temporary opportunity. They achieve also the highest level of attention in the strong and the strongest media response. B 
Behind them, in an analogy to the sales room, the regular museum spaces are accessible with their permanent exhibitions. Here, one can reliably encounter the most famous works of art history over and over again in the long term, uh, in a long term, if not even permanent arrangement. For decades, the canonized paintings present themselves to visitors who revisit them over and over again from generation to generation. Many visitors enter the museum space with the top images of Western art, of the Western art canon in their minds, because they have already seen them countless times in reproductions, books, and magazines, on calendars or postcards. They are already ingrained in the bourgeois educational memory. Visiting museums is therefore always also inspired not only by the curiosity of new discoveries, but by the desire to re-encounter the old favorites. With each re-encounter, the impression deepens and enriches the memory imprint of the images. It is in this renewed exchange with canonical images and classical works of art that cultural education and aesthetic understanding unfolds. Pure storing spaces, on the other hand, like the cellar or the attic, are much less accessible, rarely visited and generally hidden from view. The Italian photographer Mauro Fiorese has made an interesting series of photographs in the cellars of great museums. In his series, series called Treasure Rooms, he focuses on what is only stored and hidden from view and thus exists on the reverse side of attention, well preserved, but spatially excluded. And as you can see in the next uh, slide, very well locked away, invisible and forgotten. A very safe space, but an invisible space. <clears throat> Temporal images of remembering and forgot forgetting. A central source of imagery for the temporal dynamics of remembering and forgetting. One of them is the complex of death and rebirth or revival. It plays a major role in the conceptual self-understanding of the Renaissance. While the humanists of the early modern period prided themselves in their conscious retrieval and restoration of a dead culture, Back to life, thanks to their huge efforts in education and learning. Another version was the 20th century art scholar A.B. Warburg, who reinterpreted Renaissance, this epochal concept, in terms of a metaphor of unconscious return of the repressed. Another popular image provider for remembering and forgetting is the biorhythm of sleeping and awakening. I just recall a few impressive verses from T.S. Eliot's uh, verse drama, The Rock, where he says, exactly this is just um, that we have two different dimension, two dimension um, image is the slate, which we can wipe, wipe out, it's the disc. Um, the, the 3D <clears throat> image is the storeroom, 4D image, uh, the image is now time. And here is T.S. Eliot with his the thoughts about remembering and forgetting as a model for sleeping and waking up. We are children quickly tired, children who are up in the night and fall asleep as the rocket is fired and the day is long for work or play. We tire of distraction or concentration. We sleep and are glad to sleep, controlled by the rhythm of blood and the day and the night and the seasons. And we must extinguish the candle, put out the light and relight it, forever must quench, forever relight the flame. In the myth of Gnosis of late antiquity, sleeping and awakening are associated with forgetting and remembering <clears throat> a former or more authentic state of existence. We can find this motive of sleeping and waking as a <clears throat> signal of deep transformation in fairy tales such as Snow White or Sleeping Beauty, where life is suddenly arrested uh, for a longer duration and falls back into an unconscious state of sleep. 
This metaphor is used in everyday journalism, journalism, for instance. An article on German colonial history was titled Don Röschen Schlaf beendet, Sleeping Beauty has woken up. A particularly sensuous uh, image for temp temporary forgetting is freezing and thawing. Ruth Klüger, for example, when writing down her memories of her experiences in concentration camps and death camps, came up <clears throat> against a sudden barrier in her memory after 50 years. She could no longer remember when writing the false name that she and her mother had adopted while fleeing shortly before the end of the Second World. World War. She picked up the phone and called her then 87-year-old mother. The mother, after, and now I quote, after a short hesitation, calls up the stored name on the screen of her memory. Kalish was our name on the wrong papers. At first, the name means nothing to me. Kalish. It's like food you take out of the freezer, odorless and tasteless. Then, when it thaws, a slight aroma emanates from it. From far away, I taste it, chewing on it. Because it was frozen and is now thawing, it has retained the smell of the February wind of 1945, when the efforts of our flight finally were successful. What is happening in these Examples of a rhythmic dynamic is compressed and expressed in the small proposition re. And I was absolutely delighted to find that the ICI has even made a publication on this <laughs> syllable. And um, I'm absolutely fascinated with this. So it does not only appear in. Hmm? Shall I take over? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, the line is interrupted. Um, uh, we, we will wait for Alida Asman a moment. Uh, but I think uh, Sharon, um, she, she put up this uh, um, idea of the canon, who is represented in, in the museum. And this is a quite, quite uh, strong aspect. I, I just remember that um, uh, John Cage uh, in his uh, Holy Over uh, Circus uh, 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 played with this idea of uh, going into the archives, into the cellars and, and to, to reinvent or to rearrange uh, the canon. Um, and uh, he is just doing a work for us with the title Archive Carousel, mm -hmm. uh, which is just dealing with that. Um, probably you can respond to this aspect of, uh, um, uh, of, the, of the lecture of Alida, um, just for waiting yeah. for, for coming back. Well, there's no doubt that the storerooms of museums have masses of uh, potential there. So, I mean, in general, people reckon that more than 90% of what's collected is there in the storerooms. So they are very, very fertile, I think, as spaces for for artists, for researchers to do artistic kind of research, which is something I'll talk about when I have, have, have um, some pictures pictures there too. But yeah, it, one thing that we've seen, especially in recent years, is going into the archive specifically to challenge the canon, to think about uh, uh, yeah, what's been missed out mm -hmm. of um, what usually gets on public display and that re sometimes goes under titles like revisiting the collections and things and there's undoubtedly masses of potential there yeah. um, mm. and uh, you you wrote in in, in a piece uh, for the for the magazine of the exhibition mm. about different kinds of forgetting um, so mm. every um, Every choice, every presentation is also um, mm. um, is also about uh, excluding, forgetting uh, a big part of, of what is uh, has has been created. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the piece that I wrote for the Forgetting exhibition and um, that will feature in the catalogue for this one was really looking at, um, it was doing a sort of counterintuitive game, I guess, of thinking about the museum, which is the institution for remembering, but the multiple ways in which it's engaged in forgetting. So, yeah, that's uh, one of them, all the things that well, they're in the store, they may be remembered in some sort of archive, but they're not actively remembered, though for many people who've gone to ask about particular objects, it's not unusual for them to take a very long time to uh, come to the surface. And you may be told sometimes by curators, ah, we hope we haven't lost it. <laughs> so sometimes there's a real, um, yeah, forgetting where things are and so on, despite all the technologies and infrastructures that are yeah. supposed to direct you to yeah. those. Yeah. Uh, Christina, uh, do you want to respond what, what, uh, to the first uh, part of uh, Alida's um, talk? Yes. I'm, I'm ve yes. very sorry that we have this, this uh, um, uh, technical um, problem, um, but just let, let us use the, the, the time. Um. Yes, of course, it can happen um, and she will be back soon, hopefully. So um, I was very intrigued in her metaphor um, in the first metaphor she used, um, the one um, of the museum store uh, and of the three and about the three levels she uh, focused on uh, and uh, I immediately uh, thought about uh, the store by Oldenburg, uh, which is not an archive, but it's an accumulation of objects. Uh, but somehow uh, the story begins uh, at that time of art history, let's say so, in the 60s, 70s, uh, when and after with uh, institutional critique and artists who, um, let's say, dig in the museum storage or warehouse and and try to make restylings of collections of museum collections um, to narrate parallel histories let's say so but i see that alida has come back so maybe she can move on thank you very much um alida sorry this is a part of the of the game now uh, with the zoom um, Absolutely. Actually, Just, I am in Berlin. I should have come to Pariser Platz. That no. was my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I am in Berlin, but I'm I'm happy to continue. And thank you for your for your patience. Um, I Please think we can on. continue. Yeah. Yes, um, with the next slide. Um, that is stabilizing forms of duration and repetition. The next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, the next one. Exactly. So remembering and forgetting have expiration dates that are controlled by the frames and rhythms of memory that organize our consciousness. These rhythms are biologically, <clears throat> physiologically and anthropologically based and are culturally shaped. In remembering and forgetting then, it is imperative to consider this interplay of the two dimensions of space and time. There are, as I call them, stabilizing forms um, of duration, Sicherungsformen der Dauer, and stabilizing forms of repetition, Sicherungsformen der Wiederholung. Memory needs both. What is stored exclusively materially and is not reactivated again will be forgotten despite its lasting presence. This is true for monuments as well as for books. Without repetition, and here we come back to the re-reading um, re or periodic renewal, for example, on anniversaries, no memory can be formed. Cultural memory, <clears throat> like individual memory, is therefore dependent on external impulses or triggers. What is permanently stored in museums, archives, libraries must be triggered time and again on certain occasions, initiate, um, 
initiated, performed, staged and reactivated. Anniversaries and jubilees are scheduled dates that serve several functions. They create occasions for a re-encounter, another reword, with one's own history, which is critically renewed, <clears throat> reviewed, updated and synchronized in the presence on such occasions. In historical anniversaries, a society assures itself of the central key events and turning points as lasting and normative reference dates of its history. These dates form a framework for collective self-staging. <clears throat> they offer occasions for personal participation in events and they stimulate debates and reflection that update and critically renew the historical consciousness and position of a society. Forgetting, therefore, can already occur as a direct consequence if the spatial and the temporal dimensions of remembering are radically separated. Where a message is written in stone and given a monumental shape intended to reach an indefinite future, but no provision has been made for the refreshment and renewal of that message, the monument invariably loses, um, turns into a symbol of forgetting. Robert Musil famously noted a paradox here, that monuments are designed to attract attention and become unforgettable, but due to their massive immobility and solid permanence, people automatically ignore them and they become quickly invisible. The Ryder Monument, for instance, before the station in Hanover <clears throat> is um, an example. Um, it has the inscription to the patron of the country, his loyal people. Those who pass by <clears throat> it, it are no longer these loyal uh, people and hardly know which Landesvater was hoisted onto that horse. Although the monument is highly visible in public space, <clears throat> its commemorative appeal has is extinguished. The monument has changed into an object of folklore, but that does not mean that it has become superfluous. People want to see each other, to agree to meet under the tail, as it says. There are material and mental forms and techniques of forgetting, and among them, there are some <clears throat> Um, that are actively and consciously deployed or some that are passively experienced and work unconsciously. Let us take a closer look at four of these. I start with losing. Christian Boltanski brought the meaning of this word back to general consciousness <clears throat> in an exhibition staged at the Haus der Kunst in Munich <clears throat> uh, in 1997. The exhibition was called Lost in Munich and presented objects that the artist had received from the lost and found office in that city. To this day, it is the only art exhibition in which owners could pick up, up their lost items. At the same time, the exhibi exhibited objects were perceived quite differently in the new setting. Boltanski no longer worked with the formal aesthetic logic of the object trouvé, but within the very different framework of, for, of the search for traces. For Boltanski, every object has a history and is soaked with the human imprint of that individual history story <clears throat> that he is always searching for and pointing to even if there is no possibility to retrieve or reconstruct it. For Boltanski, the used object <clears throat> is a mute witness of a unique human life. In this way, he uses art to make the absence present. The object is thereby transformed <clears throat> from a commodity into a memento. And when these memories are lost, which happens inexorably, into the last witness of a life lived for <clears throat> lived or of a lost childhood. Very much like photographs, the clothes from the lost and found office are indexical signs. They uh, retain a trace and a direct contact with the one who had once 
or then the absent person to whom they once belonged. Things are full of stories. And since we no longer know them, Boltanski is the one to remind us that this knowledge is lost. The next term is destroying. It can take different forms. One of them is through deliber deliberate violence. Examples are acts of vandalism and iconoclasm that have accompanied his the history of religions and struggles in Europe. Over centuries, images, sculptures, sacred objects have fallen victim to blasphemic or zealotic uh, destruction. Today, we witness the ostentatious destruction of ancient ruins, such as the oasis city of Palmyra by the Islamic um, State. But in a different mode, also modern art <coughs> retains an iconoclastic trade when ornamental facades of historic buildings are erased to please the purism of modern architects. Abstract art is yet another case. It forbids itself the figurative richness of tradition and atonal music abolishes the rule book of harmony. Destruction, however, is not only caused by violence and intolerance, nor <clears throat> in the service of the emergence of new art forms. Catastrophes such as the fire of the Anna Amalia Library in Weimar in 2004 also destroyed cultural assets, as did the forest fire in California in 2018, which caused the manuscript of Rilke's po poem, The Panther, to go up in flames in Thomas Gottschalk's vacation home. Due to uncontrolled underground construction, the... <clears throat> um, the city archive in Cologne collapsed in 2009. Tons of archival sources were buried in the mud of the abyss. From 2011 onwards, reports were published listing recovered items that were carefully restored piece by piece. In a small scale, the small <clears throat> triumphs of recovery in the midst of the chaos of destruction were another amazing evidence of what the syllable re can stand for. Thanks to an impressive technical apparatus of cleaning, restoration and documentation, lists of the found and assigned archival documents were sent to their former owners. The word repression, finally, encompasses a whole bundle of deliberate acts of forgetting, which Stanley Cohen calls states of denial. And a description of what the state, how the state of denial comes about, we owe to Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, <clears throat> yes, I have done this, says my memory. No, I cannot have done this, says my pride. Finally, memory gives in. The, these forms of denial include covering up and concealing, silencing, dropping, bracketing, passing over, recoding, overwriting, ignoring, neutralizing, whitewashing, trivializing, normalizing. There's so many uh, <coughs> practices that all <coughs> um, amount to the same effect, namely repression. How all of these acts come to pass within the framework of collective silence in post-war Germany, I want to show by the example of a concrete example, and this is the story of the synagogue in a small town called Heigerloch im Eichtal in Baden-Württemberg. This little town presents itself on its homepage as a little lilac town, rock town, baroque, gem, and cradle of atomic research because Werner Heisenberg, the physicist, set up his research space there after the war. Cleared out but not destroyed, the synagogue remained as a strange relic um, <clears throat> of the Nazi past after 1945. Since there was no longer a Jewish community in the small town, it was sold in 1951 to a private owner who turned it into a movie theater in the 1960s. A craftsman who was involved in the renovation explained, the order was the synagogue 
should be converted into a cinema. The German word was umfunktioniert. That was a very modernist uh, technical uh, term, very um, <clears throat> current. Back then, no one, he continued, was surprised about it or gave it even a thought. Today, one would think about it much more. Today, one has much more knowledge about these things, but at the time, one just did what the master said. End of quote. So the master craftsman or the Führer, that was obviously not a big difference in this generation. Many continuities were unbroken after 1945. Visitors to the cinema remembered that they spent pleasant hours in their, their youth there watching mainly Heimat films or doctor films or love stories. After the cinema, the synagogue <clears throat> served as a spa supermarket until 1981. A shopper remembers, I quote, nobody at the time would have imagined that this had once been a synagogue. The space, we can go on, that this had once been a synagogue, this is what the synagogue was, had once been like before it turned into a supermarket. The space inside was filled up by the shelves <clears throat> and the goods that were offered there. In some places, there were slight cracks in the plaster, and you could get a glimpse of the trace of a trace of the past. The synagogue served as a supermarket until the 1970s, and then as a storage room until the end of the 80s. It was the 50th anniversary of the November pogrom night in 1981 that finally woke up the residents of the town from their long sleep. They formed a discussion group and arranged for the town to turn to buy back the synagogue. A memorial <clears throat> was established there where the history of the expelled and murdered Jews of this town is now exhibited. Today, the city's tourist uh, office lists on its homepage five top sites of the city. The synagogue is not among them. In order that something is remembered, it needs to be communicated. While <clears throat> what is passed over in silence is quickly forgotten. This applies, first of all, to the trauma, for which words are lacking and for which a new language has to be created. Robert Antelm, <clears throat> after his liberation from the concentration camp, began his account with the sentence, when we finally had the chance to begin to speak, we discovered that we had no words. But there was even more missing than an appropriate language, and that was an empathetic audience willing to listen to this story. The Israeli psychotherapist Dan Baon used the image of a double wall of silence to explain that there is not only the wall that restrains the speaker, but also the wall that wards off the listener. Silence is also considered a shield and defense for guilt and shame, which threaten the sense of pride and self-esteem. It protects the perpetrators and harms the victims. The long silence shrouding the crime of child abuse in institutions, churches and uh, schools shows silence in action. A social climate built on a strong sense of honor, fear of exposure and ostracism sustains silence. To rise <clears throat> above it requires a shared urge to clear uh, up a, uh, a crime, to show respect for the victims and to generate empathy. Finally, <clears throat> falling silent, and here's a quote from an humanist scholar who said, had we the power to forget through silence, we would lose our memory together with our voice. So there is a very strong connection here. <clears throat> Falling silent is considered a mode of forgetting in the space of knowledge for everything that is no longer circulated and therefore falls out of communication. German colonial history, for example, had been a vital part of school education in the German imperial nation. <clears throat> Before the dawn, the Kaiser has already built the fleet. Before der Morgen graut, hat der Kaiser schon an der Flotte gebaut. They had to write on their slates um, in first graders. 
This history has long since ceased to be a school topic, but its relics are right now becoming visible again in the public sphere. They are rediscovered and hotly discussed as Germans start to look at them also through the eyes of new immigrants. Let me sum up. I'm coming to my conclusion with a few general remarks about the interplay of remembering and forgetting memory in which remembering and forgetting are always intertwined, works between the two extremes of storing everything on the one hand and deleting everything on the other. Different gradations and spaces open up for what is only temporarily lost or and can be accessed again later. Remembering, in other words, is not the opposite of forgetting, since much can be retrieved. But Remembering is also a fraction of what is totally forgotten, which we also must think of and be aware of as a vast land of the no more and the nothingness that also surrounds us. Forgetting can therefore be partial, transitory and periodic, but also total. When we have forgotten what we have forgotten, it has become invisible and inaccessible, but it remains observable uh, in the process of disappearing and reappearing. To sum up, human memory is self-reflexive. Uh, Everyone is able and authorized in this case to analyze these processes in herself and in himself. Art, however, plays a crucial role in this form of monitoring as it creates a mirror of self reflection and enables a society to watch and think about its acts of remembering and forgetting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alida. Um, it, it's a very, very strong statement to, to relate remembering to forgetting. And I just will give the floor to um, you, Sharon, uh, just to, to react on, um, on the position of um, Alida Asman, please. Thank you. So, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. And for me, it's my first time as doing a non-Zoom talk for ages, so it's ever so exciting. <laughs> uh, but I'll try and contain myself. But thank you for the absolutely fantastic lecture, which just has so many dimensions. Um, I, I found myself thinking about all sorts of different in-between states and yeah, ones which sort of mix up remembering and forgetting in various ways, such as that sense one sometimes has that something's on the uh, on the tip of your tongue, uh, that you're about to remember it, but you can't quite retrieve it. Those other kinds, that they, uh, in French, there's this term des vues, not déjà vu in this case, but des vues, which is something you know is going to become a memory for the future, which is, is pretty... Uh, interesting idea, those things where you maybe smell something and you can't quite place it, but you know you're sort of remembering it, but you haven't pinned it down. Or um, those memories of your of childhood where you suddenly realize that they're kind of in the third person. So, hey, if this you're actually remembering a film or a photograph uh, and so on. So really, really many interesting things there and I guess I was thinking ah you know I'm sure there are artworks where these are reflected. But that was what I thought I would talk about. I really wanted to pick up um, this these questions about the role of art in relation to remembering, forgetting and particularly its capacities to reflect on those as processes themselves and I wanted to do so actually through um, a couple um, of examples, if I may, from projects that I've been involved in, where it's actually also about the process of that, of the artistic work, as well as the end product, and so maybe even more than the end product. So I kind of wanted to put that into uh, this, the discussion there. So um, for the first um, example, or one and a half examples that I have to hope the picture might come, um, is oh, backwards, let's see. I want to go back to the beginning. Um, the, can we go back to the beginning? Um, anyway, the, the, this is just to let you know what the 
project um, was in this case, so on cord traces, so picking up a term <laughs> that's been uh, quite used uh, already in that wonderful lecture. Uh, full title there, Transmitting Contentious Cultural Heritages with the Arts. And so here there was a, an, a, a really taking cases that particular cultural institutions or organizations had found um, to be ones that to reflect upon and to work artistically uh, there, but to develop a model that goes beyond that of the intervention. And I could talk more about why we wanted to do that, but to really develop co-production uh, methods. What you see there on that slide too is a list of the creative co-productions, as we called them, that were part of that project. And those were... Um, uh, where artists and sometimes, in, as in this case, communities, uh, researchers, cultural institutions would all work together um, and develop particular ways of dealing with particular either collections or histories um, or sites. And the, the, I'll just take one, one uh, for now, which is an, a, another synagogue story, in this case, uh, from... Romania from a town called Mediash, and you see then the names of the researchers who worked directly on on that. And this was a case of a, in a town which had been very very multicultural, as we would call it now, with Hungarians, Romanians, Germans, Jews, uh, Roma, living together um, pre-war. Uh, the, the synagogue was abandoned. Actually, not it was. It was later, really, that the Jews left the the town in the 1950s, 1960s. But the synagogue had really gone then to rack and ruin, um, and uh, the project was investigating that was, was partly um, uh, reviving the synagogue as a cultural center. But what was found was an unexpected archive. Uh, big collection of all kinds of documents and so on. You can see some of the photos there. Um, uh, there were books and uh, music scripts and so on. And so, so research was done bringing in local people from the community and you can see that happening there. The person on the right hand side of the uh, picture there looking, <laughs> looking thoughtful is uh, Razvan Anton, who I hope is, 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 is listening in and he might be able to answer anything I can't, um, who's an artist who worked with people and with these materials. And he did so in ways that really reflect um, upon uh, memory in the very formats. And he really thought carefully about issues of uh, the process and, and a kind of slow process. So what he did was actually... Um, creating these transparencies and uh, images using light as the mode of uh, producing these. And um, you can see there on that one of the images there that it produced these um, images that themselves will not last forever. They will fade. And I really liked something that he has written about it. And we've got a big book of the project that will come out uh, soon, so if you want to read more about it. But he, he writes about how light and time became the medium for filtering uh, the material. And that that process itself evokes the way in which memory itself develops. Like photographs, memories develop, fade, and perhaps disappear. So it was working with the archive, but also to produce something kind of ephemeral. And that is part of what, there you see as well, part of one of the exhibitions. And it does include there um, uh, something which was referred to as the Jewish jukebox, which um, all uh, uh, played uh, music that was constructed from uh, uh, musical scripts that were found as part of the archives. So just as well, I know we're talking about images of remembering and forgetting, but there's also the auditory, uh, the other kinds of media of remembering and forgetting. So that was very, very much a community project 
And part of our interest in the project was also, and throughout all of these research, uh, um, these creative co-productions and the whole re research, was also to see then what flows back into uh, and continues on. So it wasn't just the artworks, it's also what happens next, which was part of the research. And there is another book uh, edited by Arndt Schneider about the ethnographic uh, work on the processes as well. This is a, um, a slide of one of the other um, uh, creative co-productions that was part uh, of this Traces project as well. In this case, it was the contentious problematic archive was um, or is a collection of over 40,000 human skulls in the Natural History Museum in Vienna. There's also a very large collection of um, anthropometric and anthropometric photographs uh, as well there. And many questions there about what does scientific process and practice remember and what gets forgotten. So there, especially the questions of the individual identities of most of the um, those whose skulls uh, those were. So I, I won't say more. Actually, I won't say more about that because I'll tell you to how am I doing? I've got a couple okay. more minutes. Oh, maybe say a tiny, tiny bit more. So um, the artist Tal Adler there. So you see the whole uh, team who worked on that there, um, but. The questions were very much uh, as well about what what to show and how. And um, yeah, so Tal Adler did many interviews with different groups, uh, with um, uh, biological anthropologists, uh, those who uh, deal with the collections, also with people from various um, uh, source communities who have particular ideas about ancestors and uh, uh, about the physical, um, uh, con continue, continuing physical parts of them who maybe are also living in those particular ways of seeing. So um, there was an exhibition about that that we had in Edinburgh, but also here in Berlin um, at the Tia Anatomische Theater. But because you've missed those, because they're past, <laughs> I thought I would also uh, just end on one uh, that uh, is going to uh, come up and open soon. And this again, so it, it kind of moves on and picks up uh, from that uh, project in many ways. And this one is one that is part of this Making Differences project that you kindly, kindly mentioned at the beginning so that we're uh, working on here in, in Berlin. And this is uh, an exhibit that will go into the, uh, the Humboldt Forum and into the university's part within that, the Humboldt Labor. And what there is, it's about uh, a skull, the one with drawings on it, a phrenological skull. So these are drawings um, uh, after the phrenologist Gal. And the plan had been to exhibit this skull, but some of the curators raised questions about that, partly having seen the previous uh, uh, work uh, that was done in the Traces project. And so what Tal has been working on uh, as part of our project and for that is an exhibit that he, he's called Who is ID um, 8470? And I've inverted the numbers there, that's bad. Um, and that's the, the number that it has uh, in the collection. And what he will do there, uh, so you're getting a quick preview here, <laughs> um, is so the skull itself will not, in fact, be shown, uh, but um, a whole set of histories and also possible histories will be presented, including ghosts, the voices of ghosts, which um, Tal or spirits, which Tal has um, been in communication with in the uh, uh, spaces where the skull was. So what we end up with here are histories, memories, pasts um, that may have happened, may not have happened, um, and so on. But this is also part of a continuing 
process of research. It's not the end of it, um, because then how people respond to it when they come and so on, how it plays back into future uh, remembrance, what information with um, particular objects and so on uh, will be part of the continuing process. So I thought this was a kind of case of the archive spilling beyond and further that we could bring into, so the work of archives beyond the archive there too, uh, to bring into the discussion as well. But thank you very much for, <laughs> for giving me a chance to talk about those. No, thank you very much for uh, bringing up this curatorial practice um, into the topic. I think it's, uh, it's joining uh, the, the lecture of Alida in a, in a wonderful way. And uh, if you agree, before we are going into uh, the discussion between you, uh, I would uh, love to give uh, Christina Baldacci the floor. Um, especially, I, um, I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting to, um, to reflect on, on what is this archival turn, uh, especially in Asia, the artists are talking about, and um, uh, the idea of counter-archives, so the, uh, what, what Alida Asman uh, mentioned in the beginning, so that artistical practice is becoming a very powerful form and, and research on how memory is functioning. And uh, so I, I think we, it's wonderful that you are joining us as an expert and researcher for a long time on this topic. Uh, we are looking very much forward to hear more from you. Please. Thank Christina. you, Johannes, and many thanks uh, for the kind invitation. And again, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Alida Asman, whose work has um, been a continuous source of inspiration for my research. As you said, or just said, on artistic archives and atlases as visual form of knowledge, uh, from which my short presentation is going to start. So we all know that today archives are more alive than ever. They still retain a great charm and erratic character, having the extraordinary power to address people who are temporary, geographically, or even culturally distant from their creators, organizers, while still carrying with them their original intentions, visions, and codes. But the connection archives establish with cultural memory and both personal and collective history does not end in a Deridian nostalgic search for lost time. The reasons that still bind and push us towards archives are much more complex and affect different spheres which span from legal and political to ethical and philosophical discourse. The process of digital globalization we have been witnessing in recent years with the spread of internet and new technologies has renewed fundamental issues concerning the role of archives in remembering and forgetting. Our reliance on personal computers and as omnicomprehensive, long lasting and always handy archives along with the everyday use of social media as platforms to share and store data about our lives have increased our archiving euphoria. Somehow, we have all become amateur collectors and archivists. However, this euphoria carries with it both old and new obsessions related to archives, such as the urgency of correctly selecting, classifying, and interpreting data and documents, the danger of the centralization of too much information in one place, on a single medium, or with a single code, the confrontation with various kinds of identities, ethnic, gender, religious, cultural, the responsibility to make information universally accessible whilst respecting one's privacy, the protection and preservation of both individual and collective memory. Artists retrieve and rework all these issues when they choose the archive both as an object of investigation and as an aesthetic paradigm or metaphor. 
from the end of the 60s, while the work of art began to dematerialize and attitudes to become form, alongside the archive as a storage or warehouse, another idea of the archive has gradually been emerging. Far from being the place of the death, an unconscious accumulation of documents and objects, and of the Freudian sense of the uncanny and the fear of loss, the archive has become a discursive and subversive device in which memory plays a functional role, to use a term dear to Aleida Asman, namely a selective and critical role. Artists do not confront the archive as a passive guardian of a legacy, but rather as an active agent that gives shape to personal identity and collective of cultural memory. Therefore, in their hands, the archive is far from being just a storage place. It becomes a processual dispositif. And the Foucaultian term is more than appropriate here, which a dispositif which on the one side negotiates, challenges and validates social power, on the other puts memory into motion. Artistic practices undermine the archive as such and build new self-reflexive models, as Alida Asman just reminded us. To me, archival projects by artists are impossible archive. This is how I entitled my book on the subject. Not only because they are often encyclopedic undertakings that are difficult to carry out in a lifetime, but above all because they produce counter models, that is counter archive, which always tackle, criticize and activate from the perspective of the cultural memory and the new technologies, the traditional notion of the archive and its relationship to canon. Counter archives which originate from a collection of images and objects that are made visible through a display or montage in which, depending on the artist's intentions and idioms, can from time to time take the form of an atlas or a map, a museum or wunderkammer, a diary or album, a card file or digital database. These archival counter models are effective tools to generate parallel histories that challenge traditional Western-centric narratives, decolonizing the placing in spaces of knowledge and memory by reconfiguring them as sites of inclusiveness in service of life at large, as Achille Membe suggests, has become one of the most urgent imperatives of our neoliberal, global and anthropocentric present, especially considering that there are forms of imperialism and colonialism which no longer concern only the control exercised by traditional institutions, such as archives, museums, universities, but also new types of surveillance brought by information technology. In his book, Staging the Archive, from 2013, Ernst van Alphen is also of the idea that the use that artists have been making of the archival metaphor in the 20th and 21st centuries is fundamentally transgressive. In any case, it is a staging of the principles that rule the archive. The book itself has a theatrical structure and unfolds like a systematic story that ends in two stages. After the apparent exhaustion of the archive, which coincides, not surprisingly, with the most acute aspect of malaise linked to the 20th century memory crisis, the revival of the Holocaust and other forms of recent racial persecution, its reanimation takes over as a fundamental tool to restore the science of which the archive is the foundation, historiography. Hoping for a post-colonial and post-communist reinterpretation of the archive, Van Alphen concludes that historiography can return to have a political and personal importance. It can help us preserving our identity and memory instead of trying to cancel or have totalitarian control 
over ourselves and our actions. Who we are and how we act in the present largely depends on our past. The prefix re, previously mentioned also by Aleda Asman, may provide a keystone in building a different relationship with the past, one that does not entail pre-established art historical or critical methodology. The reverse, re, on which, as Alida recalled, I have started focusing some years ago during my fellowship at the ICI Berlin and uh, a publication came out uh, about the re-prefix tends to hover between back and again, giving rise to complex patterns in space and time that come up with some unexpected resonances and correlations. The prefix re serves as an effective tool decanonizing a certain mode of interpretation and provides new hermeneutic tools for our contemporaneity, probably also weakening the postmodernist obsession with the prefix post, which according to some, Nicola Burio in particular, has undermined the foundation of modernism without offering a true alternative in the present. Although any prefix that historians or critics use to shake off a prior mode of interpretation inevitably set up a new canon, the beauty of re is that it can be repeated again and again in a process of framing and unframing that leaves no room or time for conceptual closure. If related to artistic production, re-practices, including above all reenactments reenactment as image reactivation imply the gesture of presenting anew instead of representing, where shortening the perceptual space-time distance enable the experiencer or re-experiencer, be they interpreter or public, to take part, part in a re-presencing, not so much rewriting of history. The gesture of restoring visibility to something no longer present, an absence, reactivating or re-embodying it as an object image in and for the present is a political act of restitution and historical recontextualization. At this point, before concluding, let me advance a first definition of reenactment as the act of reappropriation or aneignung, in Paul Ricoeur's words, the process by which one makes one's own, eigen, what was initially other of or alien, friend. An exercise of reinterpretation in the sense of working through or durcharbeiten, from the verb durcharbeiten, to use Freud's famous expression, which San François Lyotard later exhumed. A process of reconstruction, given that the event or object to be reactivated is often chosen precisely because it was left unfinished, or got lost or altered as an artifact or memory. And then a gesture of remediation in the sense of the term given by Jay Bolter and Richard Grusin in their well-known book of 1999, that is reworking and transposing not just from one time and or setting to another, but also from one support idiom or medium to another. And finally, the act of recirculating images across time, space, the media, and later recontextualizing them. What happens to images nowadays digital and their formal and semantic values when more or less unawares they migrate from place to place or culture to culture in our globalized world? Do they still stand as vectors of memory and afterlives in the Warburgian sense? I, leave, I will leave this question open for discussion. Let me just add that, as an artist's practice, reenactment entails a series of issues largely concerning the link 
with institutional context and the social political structure that images and his artworks are situated in, the process of selecting them, the difference that occur between original and copy in the process of repetition or adaptation, revising, all aspects that at the core of the process that are at the core of the process of remembering and forgetting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. It's uh, great to uh, really fantastic to to have this perspective uh, from from uh, the artistic uh, practices. And um, just before I uh, I open uh, for you uh, both. Um, or you three, um, I just want to bring in one aspect which I, I remembered um, uh, in, in, in having a project uh, with two Namibian artists um, on, on their work uh, where um, uh, a very crucial aspect was in remembering, reenacting uh, the aspect of healing and care. And I think this is a, is a, is a point behind uh, which I, I would like to touch in, uh, in, in this aspect of, of remembrance and uh, uh, as an aspect or a, a part of destroying, forgetting and so on, as an aspect of healing, especially in the toxic uh, um, topics of, uh, of our society. But this is just one, one point. I, I, I just give, give the floor to you, please. Who, uh, who wants to react first? Alida? Well, if, if possible, yeah, I would like to respond directly respond to what you just brought up, um, the idea of healing and care. Uh, when we speak of curators, um, the word is also cura, which means uh, sorge, to care, um, is involved in the whole process of uh, archival work. And of course, they preserve and they help to <clears throat> so that uh, later generations will find something and can, um, can use it. But uh, I think there's also a very direct um, reference here. And I would like to introduce another term which we haven't used so far. It's another word that starts with re. And it is <laughs> repair. I found this term repair in Mbembe's uh, writings. I was always very impressed with this, the way with, in which he uses reparieren and repair. And I must say that... <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the even topmost uh, reference to it came lately when I heard Amanda Gorman's uh, inauguration poem, in which she says, being American <clears throat> is not only the pride we inherit, but the past we step into and how we repair it. Inherit rhymes with repair it. And I think this is fantastic. Also the past we step into, the uh, idea that there is an availability of the past here in the future. Um, availability is a positive term. We can still do something about it. Um, it is a traumatic past, but we can step into and uh, the question is how we repair it. It's an offer. It is a very <clears throat> future directed form uh, of memory. It is It also, uh, includes the whole society and it has to do with assuming a new <clears throat> attitude or um, <clears throat> uh, knowledge about this past. And it is something that can only be um, reached um, if we change perspectives, if we um, collect the different perspectives and also move our positions and see from different points of view. So I think this, this whole um, notion of repair also uh, ties in wonderfully with uh, with the other examples that we have seen um, and have just been shown about. Um, thank you, uh, Susan, for the very concrete examples. I'm I'm really impressed also with its um, projection. Uh, the idea of the projecting photo is is such a powerful medium. I I recall Shimon Atti's. Um, images uh, that he did of the uh, Jewish uh, Scheunenviertel, um, historic images on the very identical buildings now, so creating a palimpsest of these uh, different periods. And also another artist in, in Hamburg who 
worked on a house before it was sold to be um, yeah, used for other purposes. He wanted to first use one year to find the history of this building in Hamburg. And what he did was he re <clears throat> restored the whole uh, history of the of a family and he invited them back in and they he used the family photos exactly as as you showed us uh, he projected them on the on the walls and within the, in the house in the empty house on the walls outside and inside the building this is an extremely powerful um sudden almost revelation of another time and a consciousness that uh, this present that we inhabit is not a totality it's always only a, a shred of, of, of something uh, something else so um, these are two marks and also the archive thank you for uh, Christina for bringing this back in because the archive has I have actually started my work in the 1980s uh, with this concept of the artist of archive and it these were the artists who had discovered it and it was an aesthetic uh, paradigm uh, of course uh, which triggered uh, definitely my interest. Um, right now, I, after listening to you, um, it became interesting for me again, because I see here um, a really a big tension in the archive or um, um, different possibilities, namely, namely on the one hand to control something. If we have the archive, then we are in full control of information and we sort it out and it, everything is at hand. But on the other hand, we have so many ex uh, examples of archives that are not um, <clears throat> created, but that uh, are revealed all of a sudden. And uh, um, here the whole dynamics of voluntary and involuntary memory uh, also comes up. Um, suddenly we are confronted. And, and here, Susan, thank you for re referring to the Natural History Museum in Vienna. I was in that building in the beginning of the 2000s. And uh, that it was a reception after um, a workshop and the director of the museum uh, with a glass of sherry in his hand or whatever uh, told us, maybe you know not where we are. We thought we were in the Natural uh, History Museum. And he said, no, you are in the biggest Vien Viennese cemetery, much larger than the uh, Zentralfriedhof. That's what he told us and that he uh, he pulled up uh, uh, the, the drawers and he showed us. And, and this was, in a way, a, a total uh, shock. Mm, obviously, at that time, it was not yet uh, the really the, the emotional burden that we feel today. He, he just thought, this is awkward. What, what, what do we do with that? It used to be a, a voluntary collection, a treasure for science. And science is not very emotional about this. Very, And now we have a legacy. And what do we do with it? So I'm, I'm really delighted to hear that um, in Edinburgh and other places, um, people are working on it and bringing it, it back because we have to create a new language and new frames in order to uh, think about these things. So arts makes, um, make these things visible and also feelable <laughs> again. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, you, you... Yeah, I mean, just maybe really briefly on the issues of care and repair, which I absolutely agree are very, very important. And I guess what we're seeing there is a, um, a coming together of environmental concerns and discourses uh, together with those about pasts and histories there. And I was just trying to remember, but it's one of those things, you know, when you work on memory, I don't know, <laughs> I forget things much more, uh, but this, um, one thing I think is, is really important with repair is that it's done without, um, th that we keep the joins and the marks of what has been done. And that's the kind of notion of repair I think that we need to keep. What, the word I was trying to remember <laughs> is a Japanese w word for where mm -hmm. pottery is broken and you preserve it by keeping the lines and marks and actually it increases with value over time with those with those histories and uh, keeping those in the frame and I think in a, in a way all, all the many of the examples we've seen are exactly about that keeping those things in the frame there and seeing that that you know it's not the sort of repair work of the past where it was like sweep away but I mean and that's part of the very yeah, presence and importance of the archives. 
now, I think, is yeah. bound up with that. Um. I, I had a, the chance to, to participate in a pro project which um, called um, Reinventing Britain. I think it was in 1997, so 30, 20, 25 years ago. Um, it was uh, initiated by um, Stuart Hall and uh, Sarat Maharaj, uh, Humika Baba. So it was uh, the, because I, I thought about it because of the re, reinventing Britain. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was an incredible experience um, uh, what, what, what the potential of this re is. And I, I, I never could find a, a German uh, uh, parallel to, to, to this reinventing, rewriting, uh, recreating. Um, and uh, I think it was so strong uh, to see how the cultural studies and how the artistic development in, in, in the 90s changed the complete idea of, uh, of an aesthetic uh, of, of, of what is British, of what is, uh, is English, uh, transformed into to, to a new vision with, which is defining uh, European international art today. And um, I think this, this is really the, the potential of, um, of, of thinking, uh, remembering in a productive, critical aspect. And I think you talked about that and, and probably we can, can focus on this aspect again, uh, that remembering is a, is a critical form uh, or can become a critical form uh, in, in some way even a kind of resistance uh, to to a canon, to a main reading, to to common sense, and um, and this could be a, a very interesting point. Picking up your aspects of of your uh, your statements. Yeah, uh, it is, and uh, of course, uh, remembering, especially when dealing with artistic practices uh, connected to the archive, uh, means also to as you said, reinventing, but also reimagining, not reinventing, reimagining. Um, because um, Sharon before said that uh, she introduced another concept which uh, for, let's say, uh, artistic practice is crucial, uh, which is fiction. Uh, because, of course, uh, we don't have all the evidences uh, and uh, of the past in the archive and uh, we can't uh, uh, let's say be sure that even photographs or other let's say the usual evidences or the ones that we think are evidences are telling the truth the truth so um, of course what uh, artists do is using imagination and, and fiction a lot to fill the gaps mm -hmm. uh, and this is the poetic side of uh, this um, let's say repair of this rehabilitation of the past in the present um, in the present and um, so uh, this is another, let's say fiction is another important uh, term that we could introduce in our discussion. And uh, about care and repair, repair is, is um, a word that has been used uh, a lot um, in artistic practice. If you think there is especially one, one artist, but he's not the only one who is uh, using a lot the concept of repair, who is Kader Atia, who is living in, in Berlin, working also in Berlin. Um, and and of course, of course, taking care, taking care first of all of the archive uh, is, is another fundamental gesture. And uh, um, it's also a very feminine, I would add, gesture. Um, and uh, I'm I'm sorry that I couldn't. Uh, let's say, um, focus a little bit more on the, the images, on the artworks I showed you, but um, 
almost all uh, the, the the artists I showed during my presentation uh, really um, take care of the archive and uh, especially or one of, of the artists, Marisha Lewandowska, who digged into the Venetian archives and, and tried to uh, rebuild or reimagine the history of the Venice Biennale uh, in a feminist way. So uh, thinking of uh, the birth of the Venice Biennale more than 100, um, a century ago um, as, uh, let's say, um, that the Biennale was started from a group of women and not of, of gentlemen, of gentlewoman, Venetian gentlewoman and, and women and not gentlemen. And, and she produced uh, a, a fictive evidence, uh, a fictive testimony uh, to be put inside the, the real archive. Uh, and or the real Venetian archives to fill the gaps, as I said. So um, rehabilitating, repairing, taking care of the archives uh, are all actions, uh, crucial actions for, for artists, of course, but not just for artists. Uh, and I, I was very, just to, uh, to address again, Alida, um, also, um, I liked very much this idea, um, again, speaking or um, of a reword of the re-encounter with, with, with our own past. No? Re-encounter is really a, a wonderful uh, reword uh, because uh, it's again uh, a word that has, uh, let's say, the care inside it because uh, encounter is always uh, taking care of the other may it be a person or or an event the past and etc and uh, i think that it all also gives this idea uh, of um, reconnecting and and repairing as well uh, so um, I thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, nearly uh, a closing word, recounter, but I see that uh, Alida uh, yeah. want to, to say more. Please, Alida, last statement. Just, just adding one sentence because I'm aware now that we are using very different concepts of repair. We can repair objects, vessels, and then we want to see the traces where we repaired them and so on. But I was invoking this um, phrase from Membe und Gommen, and they don't think of repairing vessels, they are not archaeologists. They think about repairing the past, a ruined past, a shattered past, and how what we do with the shards of the past, and whether we can write, um, this is the way Membe uh, puts it, uh, that we might see that we have a common history or biography and that we might write it together. This is what he meant by repair. And uh, this is a project for the future. It is. It takes us out of archaeology and, and art. It is really the project of our time to <clears throat> see how these uh, different histories can, um, can converge. They do not converge, but how they can be by a feminist or non-feminist uh, action of repair, how they can be woven back, woven together um, after they had been so destructively um, opposed and uh, in, the, in the past. So this is the other uh, dimension of repair for which I think uh, the arts also have a place. Can I just say Absolutely. something back Please. to that? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a contrary. I mean, I, I absolutely take or, or recognize what notion of repair is being made there, but I think even in those, what we need to bear in mind is where were the fish, fish, fissions and so on of the past and that those, I mean in many ways those are the things that will bring things together and so on. So yeah, maybe the metaphors have, um, yeah, we can pick different bits, bits out of the particular metaphor and we always find that if we push metaphors far enough they don't entirely hold up but I think that what we see, especially in many of the cases we've looked at, is it's precisely that 
that troubling of some of those um, pieces and how they were joined together and came apart. And I might just say there too, just if I might, back to the fiction point, which, yeah, I'm, re I'm really glad you picked up there, Christina. One of the things that I th think there was a really great re resonance on, and I can't say any word beginning with re without <laughs> marking it, <laughs> uh, but great resonance with um, a lady's uh, lecture there was you're really kind of troubling remembering and forgetting as, as sort of either or alternatives. And I think what we see in so many of the artworks is precisely doing that, but alongside these ideas of fact and fiction as well, and uh, really kind of raising questions about those. And I think that's often what the, you know, the power of the works very often is precisely in sort of, yeah, unsettling those uh, for us. Thank you. I'm I'm very much looking for uh, the re-encounter uh, between us. I, I invite you uh, all to come here and uh, to to go through the exhibition together and to talk with the artists. Um, a lot of what you talked about is is uh, uh, is in 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 the artworks itself, um, and uh, I'm very very grateful that you could do it to come here to to be uh, with us um, in the Zoom. Uh, thank you very, very much, Alida Asman, Christina Baldacci and uh, Sharon McDonald uh, for uh, being here. Uh, thank you very much to everybody who is joining our, our meeting. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Lina Brion, uh, who did make it happen that we can stay here. Thank you very much. Bye bye.